So tell us briefly how you came to the conclusion that perhaps not surprisingly, New York and London are great for entrepreneurship, um, but Silicon Valley isn't in there. Tell, tell us your findings. Well, uh, the city's a, a, a guidebook for policymakers that's designed to help them create the best possible conditions for innovation and entrepreneurship. And so what we did was we designed uh, a framework for thinking about good policy in this area by looking at what goes on in cities around the world and bringing that together. And then we assessed 40 cities globally uh, to see how they perform against that best practice. Now what we measured was not the quantity of startups in, a, in any particular place or the amount of venture capital flowing through it. Um, but the quality of the policy environment. And that meant that some places like uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, um, uh, Boston, uh, maybe Berlin, that you would expect to see right at the top if you were just looking for the quantity of startups, drop down slightly. And other perhaps less expected cities who have governments that are more focused on this agenda perhaps, um, moved up to the top. Places like Helsinki and mm, Amsterdam. Which came in third. Helsinki came in third. It's doing great stuff. Um, really innovative um, initiatives coming out of there. They've got um, a, a sort of nascent uh, tech cluster around their mobile gaming industry with companies like uh, Rovio and Supercell. And the government's quietly um, doing lots of good things that give it the best chance, I think, to grow. And I should have said that Caroline joined us around the desk with her tech hat on. Caroline. Yeah, tech hat on. And Barcelona is an interesting one, isn't it? Because it did incredibly well in an awful lot of the areas you were assessing it in, all apart from really regulatory environment. What is Barcelona, Barcelona doing so wrong and what could it improve? So Barcelona is slightly unfortunate in this respect, in that um, a combination of local courts and uh, the government in Madrid have effectively banned Uber and Airbnb from operating. Um, and so what we measured was the extent to which the city has an, a regulatory environment that's conducive to entry by these kind of new disruptive players. So they do pretty badly in that one. And it's a real shame because actually the rest of the city has been doing lots of good work to try and create a, a fertile environment. But I guess there's no point in sort of investing money in startup accelerators if you're then going to ban the companies that come out the other side of it. It's fascinating though, isn't it? Because you're talking about the overlay of city regulatory environments and national regulatory environments, or maybe even supernational in some cases. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean... All of the credit or discredit does not belong to these cities, perhaps, does it? Not exclusively. On the whole, we've focused on things that cities can control, um, things that they can act on, things that they can be held accountable for. Um, as I said, this is, this is about trying to help them make better policy, and so we try to focus on things that they can change themselves. But, but as you say, cities operate within sort of complex national and supranational environments, and it's not always possible to sort of hone in just on the things that they own. I mean, you've had previous roles where you've advised the UK government. You've, you were announcing this yesterday in, in Second Home, and, and you sort of accelerator a great home hub for startups in in London talk to us about what London needs to do what would you be advising the mayor and David Cameron right now if we needed to make it even more thriving for entrepreneurs well it's so, so London came second um, it's really great um, and there's no doubt that London's tech scene is in rude health at the moment um, but if you kind of take a step back from the analysis it's it's hard not to be left with the impression that lots of cities around the world are just moving a bit more quickly than London on this stuff. They're investing a lot more heavily on it. And so if London wants to maintain its position at the top of these kind of rankings, I think it's possibly going to have to hit the accelerator a little bit more. I think where I'd start would be within City Hall. Um, London doesn't have some of the key leadership positions in place that other cities have benefited from, like a chief data officer, a chief technology officer, and that kind of thing. Um, and so we found that cities that make those kind of changes, that install those positions, tend to see a sort of step change in their performance, and uh, it's kind of a really great way of getting things done. Is there a really cool innovation that you could have, you've spotted in one of the smaller cities that's really forward-thinking that you think, well, New York and London, they need to do that if they're going to sort of maintain their, their crown? What are the other, um, the, 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 the ones that are coming up the rails, what are they doing so right? Well, there's loads of interesting stuff going on around the world. Um, and the eye is kind of drawn to the very big and the very small sometimes. Um, at the kind of bigger end of the scale, um, New York's uh, redevelopment of uh, Roosevelt Island into a gigantic tech campus is, is sort of breathtakingly impressive. Um, they've put $100 million of public money and $400 million of land into a massive project with um, Cornell University, and it's going to create this massive pipeline of skills for the city. The smaller things in the kind of slightly more remote cities, lots of places have free public Wi-Fi. Um, Helsinki has it, Tallinn has it, Melbourne has it, Dubai has it, so why shouldn't London have it? Mm. Elena, I mean, there is a point that this isn't just about tech, this is about entrepreneurship, this is about building businesses, and you're busy doing that too. Yes. Do you agree <laughs> that London and New York are where it's at? 
Well, I think that skills investment is uh, something, I mean, it's fascinating to me as a macroeconomist that um, with all the things that we use to judge the health of the, uh, the microfabric of an economy in terms of growth potential like uh, the digital infrastructure, the access to financing, the access to skills, uh, that policy risk is one of the key things that you highlight here. And I absolutely love the fact that there is, there is potential uh, in London to, to, to develop further. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, do you think that there should be some kind of a public scheme in terms of rolling out uh, digital education for older people like me? <laughs> I think they should. Um, there's a big question about whether that's something that lives at a city level or at a, at a higher level of government, but I think they should. Um, and London's doing some good work in this, um, in this area. So they, they, they back um, tech apprenticeships um, with, with local businesses, and that's kind of a, help, a healthy thing. But